mathematics, astronomy, medicine, chemistry, geography, architecture, literature, and art. While the Christian West was in the so-called Dark Ages, culture and science flourish in the Islamic world. This heritage can still be found in many of the names and terms we use today, such as alchemy, algorithm, algebra, number, tariff, or elixir. These are just some of the Arabic words that have found their way into our everyday language. They refer to a time when the strongholds of science and scholarship were in lands where Islam prevailed. The first word that Allah revealed to the Prophet was Koro, read. Muslims were motivated to acquire knowledge from the very beginning. Conservative Muslims often want to see this statement limited to the doctrine of faith alone, but already in the 8th century, Islamic scholars held the view that this principle should apply to all knowledge. Because, according to one explanation, the basic tendency of the Islamic faith towards knowledge and education is evidenced by the words of the Prophet Muhammad himself. The pursuit of knowledge is a duty for every Muslim. Whoever strives for knowledge worships God. Whoever chooses a path to attain knowledge, Allah, will make the path to paradise easier for him. Therefore, a few generations after the lifetime of the Prophet, schools and universities were established and the Islamic education system reached a standard that the Western world was centuries behind. The beginning of the Golden Age of Islam is associated with the Abbasid period, the second dynasty of Islamic rule, which began in the middle of the 8th century, and during this time, especially from the 9th century onwards, people had a growing interest in science and knowledge. In the Abbasid era, the Islamic world became more and more heterogeneous in cultural and political terms. Linguistic and cultural influences came primarily from Iran, but also from the Maghrib region in North Africa and from India. As a result, Islam gradually lost its purely Arab character and developed into a world religion. In the new capital of the Abbasid Caliphate, the circular city of Baghdad, founded in 762, a center for art, culture, science, and research emerged in just a few decades. Baghdad grew to become one of the largest and most important cities of the world in the first millennium. Al-Andalus in southern Spain, which was ruled by Islamic conquerors since the year 711, in particular the Emirate of Cordoba and the later Emirate of Granada, also flourished as a second stronghold of culture, science, and art. At this time, Islamic universities, the madrasas, were established and became also points of attraction for the few Christian Europeans who were able to read and write. While in the Western world, books and writings were kept under lock and key, behind the walls of monasteries, Islamic libraries were filled with millions of books, accessible to everyone. The Library of Cordoba alone had an inventory of nearly half a million writings. Caliph Harun al-Abu, al Abbas Abdullah al Mamun was the ruler of the Abbasid Empire from 813 to 833. He was a great supporter of science and had the vision of bringing together all the world's scientific writings in one place. And this place, of course, was the city of Baghdad. As a result, al Mamun founded the Bit al Hikmah, the House of Wisdom, in 825, in which numerous writings were translated from Greek, Aramaic, Persian and Indian into Arabic, including the groundbreaking scientific works by Aristotle, Galen, Hippocrates, Plato, Ptolemy, Euclid, and Archimedes. This was the beginning of the Islamic world's scientific heyday. It is interesting to note that alongside Arabs and Persians, Christians and Jews were also allowed to work and research in the House of Wisdom and thus also became part of this golden age. Many sciences experience an immense boost, including medicine. Already during the caliphate of al-Mamun's father, who was none other than the legendary Caliph Harun al-Rashid, many hospitals and mobile medical centers were established. 
The focus of medical research was also on Baghdad, where more than 850 hospitals had been built during the peak of the Abbasid Caliphate. Their sites were chosen on strictly hygienic criteria. The hospitals were divided into different departments and even had surgical services. The discoveries of the Islamic physicians in the field of medicine provided the entire basis for Western medical research. Abu Bakr al-Rasi, who was the director of a hospital in Baghdad, conducted research in measles and smallpox in addition to his surgical work. His writing, The Book of Medicine, was considered one of the most outstanding works in this field until the 18th century. Another outstanding medic was Ali ibn Isa, who made significant discoveries in the field of ophthalmology around the year 1000. As early as the 11th century, Ibn Sina wrote a comprehensive medical compendium that was translated into Latin and known in Europe as Canon Medicinia. If you think you have never heard the name of this scientist, he might be known by his Latin name Avicenna. Many names of Muslim scholars who provided knowledge to the Western world were changed in such a way that they no longer revealed the true origin of their works. For example, the name of al Rossi was also changed into Rosses. These few examples are not even a fraction of what Islamic medicine actually had to offer, but the knowledge in the field of astronomy was also groundbreaking. While Christian Europe still held the geocentric view of the universe, with the Earth as the center of the world, Muslims knew the heliocentric view, based on the astronomy of the Greeks. This worldview was indeed in harmony with Islam, as the Quran states that each planet has its orbit. Through observation and accurate research, Islamic celestial science became the world's leading astronomy for centuries. Muslims developed the most accurate observation and measuring instruments and star charts. Astronomy was a very important science for Muslims, since it was necessary to know the cardinal points in order to be able to pray in direction of Mecca, especially at a time when the Islamic world became larger and larger. Astronomical discoveries were so many that they can hardly be enumerated. Other religious practices also required mathematical and astronomical studies. For example, it was necessary to define the exact beginning and end of day and night in order to determine the times for prayer. Precise calendar studies were necessary to define the exact beginning of the fasting month of Ramadan. It was mainly during this heyday of Islamic scholarship that scientists developed systematic methods of experimentation and observation, which were only applied in Europe centuries later. They wrote commentaries on translations from other languages and, like the scholar Al-Biruni, also directed their interest in knowledge towards India. In the 10th century, Islam stretched from Spain through North Africa and the Middle East to the Indian frontier. Islamic scholars took the knowledge from all these cultural areas and put it together. In the process, the knowledge of the ancient Greeks, Indians, and Iranians became intertwined. From Chinese captives of war, the Muslims also learned how to make paper, and thus the best conditions were created for noting down and further developing all the knowledge available at the time. About two centuries after the exodus of the Prophet Muhammad from Mecca to Medina in 622, an intellectual climate developed in Islam that was particularly conducive to the study of astronomy, mathematics, and medicine. Incidentally, the year 622 is the beginning of the Islamic calendar, according to which people still live in Islamic countries today. Islam has some requirements for performing prayers, which can be solved only with the help of astronomy, and that is why the research was advanced. Great importance was given to the moment when the extremely narrow crescent of the new moon was first visible in the western evening sky. This was the exact moment when the new month was proclaimed. It is not without reason that the crescent of the moon became the symbol of Islam. In order to predict the appearance of the new moon, careful calculations and observations were necessary. 
Another requirement was the direction of prayer, the Qibla, because Muslims always perform their prayers towards the Kaaba, in the city of Mecca, no matter where they are. In the same way, mosques are also oriented in the same direction. Long before the invention of the compass, this required precise knowledge of geography, the distances between cities and their location, which could be expressed in degrees of longitude and latitude. However, in order to be able to lay a measuring grid over the earth, it was necessary to know how big the globe is. This task was to be solved by land surveys and astronomical measurements. And so, the Muslims developed cartography and new methods of land measurement. Islamic scholars were able to calculate the radius and circumference of the earth globe just as precisely as the Greek mathematician Eratosthenes did around 200 BC. The correct times must be determined for the daily prayers. The call to prayer, the Adhan, is proclaimed at sunrise, at noon, in the afternoon, at sunset, and in the evening. Since the days are not of equal length throughout the year, there are no fixed times for them. This required close observation of the movement of the sun to determine its rising and setting times and its highest point. It only was possible through extensive and accurate observations and calculations. The methods transmitted by the Greeks were not sufficient. They were further developed and improved in Islamic times. The Muslims also adopted observation instruments such as the astrolabe from the Greeks. An astrolabe, which is also known as planisphere, is an instrument to simplify astronomical calculations and time determination. It is basically a two-dimensional model of the sky, consisting of several brass discs in a frame that can be rotated against each other. Various lines and coordinates are engraved on the brass discs, but also the most important stars are recorded. Islamic scientists not only copied the astrolabe from the Greeks, but they also improved it and translated the star names, which Ptolemy had fixed in his Almagest into Arabic. These names were later preserved when they were translated back into Latin, which is why the most important stars still bear Arabic names today. Star names as Aldebaran, Hamal, Ater, Regal, Sodal Malik, and many others, as well as the terms Sinith and Nadir, came from Arabic. Even if most of these names and terms appear very alienated today due to repeated mistranslations. One of the most important astronomers was Muhammad ibn Jabir al-Batani, Latinized al -Bitinius. He lived around the year 900 and preserved the works of Ptolemy, in which he determined, among other things, the inclination of the ecliptic and the equinox. The Abbasid Golden Age even allowed a woman to work in scientific fields in the male-dominated Islamic world. Maryam al astarlabi who lived in the 10th century, came from Aleppo, in present-day Syria. She manufactured astrolabes and is the only woman mentioned in the Kitab al firist a compendium of the knowledge and literature of 10th century Islam, compiled by Ibn al-Nadim. The actual first name of this female scientist has not survived, but she was later given the name Maryam. However, it is known that she was engaged at the court of Saif ad daula and practiced her profession there, which she had taken over from her father. One of the most outstanding astronomers was Muhammad ibn Musa, also known as Al-Khwarizmi, who is mainly remembered as the founder of algebra and is considered the most important mathematician of his time. Even the terms algebra and algorithm are derived from his name. However, it is difficult to limit Islamic scientists to only one field of science, since often an astronomer was also an outstanding mathematician, physician, and much more. Mathematics is closely linked with astronomy. Both sciences have always inspired and advanced each other. 
and here, too, Islamic scholars have provided invaluable services. They adopted the number system and especially the number zero from the Indians. With zero it was much easier to calculate. The Indo-Arabic number system replaced Roman numerals in the West and is still used all over the world today. Through translations of Arabic scripts into Latin, the new decimal notation came to Europe and was immediately and very gladly adopted by mathematicians, because the calculation was much easier than with the previously used Roman numerals. We all use the Arabic numerals today, even though they have changed a bit over the centuries. There was no scientific field into which people did not advance under Islamic supremacy. Al-Hasan ibn al-Haytum, also known as Al-Hasan, explored the field of optics. The entire modern optics is based on his work, Optitia Thesaurus. He experimented with a sort of pinhole camera, the archetype of photography. Mistakenly, Leonardo da Vinci is considered the inventor of the pinhole camera, the pump, the first flying machine, and the turning lathe. However, his designs are proven to be dependent on the work of Al Hassan, who lived about five centuries before Leonardo. Many advances made by Islamic astronomers ultimately remained without consequence, such as the Samarkand Observatory built by Alug Beg in the early 15th century. As the best of its time, it was dismantled after only one generation by Oleg Beg's successors and left to decay. Other Islamic observatories suffered a similar fate, only the observatory of Maraga, built by Nasir al-Din al-Tusi in 1264, survived its builder by nearly 40 years before it was closed at the beginning of the 14th century. Although the Islamic astronomers recognized the errors of the ancient theories and improved them, their most important achievement from today's point of view was nevertheless the preservation, translation, and partial expansion of ancient natural science, which European culture was hardly able to do during the early Middle Ages. With the end of the Golden Age of Islam, however, Islamic astronomy was hardly able to give any impulse to European astronomy, and its achievements were finally overtaken by the European Renaissance and fell into oblivion. The level of development of Islamic astronomy is also exemplary for the astronomy of other cultures, which reached a similar level, but could not develop beyond it, also without telescopes. Particularly worth mentioning are the Indian or Vedic astronomy, the Chinese and the pre-Columbian astronomy of the Native American high cultures. All of these cultures possessed observational knowledge accumulated over many centuries that could be used to predict the periodic phenomena of the planetary system. But why did the scientific golden age of Islam come to an end, and why did they fall behind Western countries in terms of science? There are many reasons for this, but first let's look at what mindset is needed to encourage science. And also, how science, religion and philosophy are connected. This is best reflected in the example of astronomy, the oldest of all natural sciences. One early motivation for observing the skies was certainly of a practical nature. The periodic movements of the celestial bodies were used for chronological and geographical orientation, for navigation, for the making of calendars, for the division of the seasons, of fertile and infertile periods, for the observance of the cycles of nature on which human life depended. This is where the empirical astronomy has its origins. At the same time, however, the invariable recurrence of celestial bodies in the sky seemed to reveal the seat of the gods and eternal powers, influencing the cycles of nature and human life. This is where religion and myth originated. The question about the world as a totality, the cosmos, its beginning, its creation, its ending, is at the same time the question about the position of the human being in the universe, its past and its future. 
Since the beginnings of human cultural history, people have been studying the cosmos, physicists, astronomers, and philosophers, but also shamans, priests, and theologians. According to a widespread principle of the 19th century, myth and religion were overcome by science. Auguste Comte taught a linear history of the progress of human culture in three stages, according to which the theological and mythological prehistory was followed by the metaphysical age, and finally, by the scientific age. As a result, for some people in modern times, natural science has taken on the role of a substitute for religion, in which scientists are supposed to decipher the ultimate questions of mankind, instead of shamans, priests, rabbis, and imams. This is where philosophy comes into play, whose important task is to distinguish conceptually and methodologically between these different approaches. Science, religion, and myth are each different ways of looking at the world with different methods and goals, which must be kept apart in order to avoid contradictions and speculation, but which are nevertheless related and can give each other food for thought. However, there are worldviews and forms of society which reject this mutual enrichment as they reject everything except religion. Today, this also applies to a large part of the Islamic world, and this view has its origins in a series of catastrophic historical setbacks that Muslims have had to endure. Many Muslims see the causes as basically not self-inflicted. To this day, outside of small circles in the Islamic world, there has hardly been any further self-critical debate about the reasons for its own stagnation. In historical memory, idealized glorious times and conquests in the name of Islam stand alongside and before the heinous attacks by Christians, from the Crusades to the colonialism of more recent history. These events are remembered as humiliations. However, according to many historians, the decline of Islam did not begin with the Crusades. Although the wars with the Christian West certainly contributed to this, they were not the only cause of the downfall. However, one of these events was definitely caused by the Europeans. The reconquest of Spain, which was occupied by the Muslims since the age of the Umayyads, led to the destruction of Cordoba in 1236 and thus destroying one of the two cultural centers of Islam. Cordoba was probably the most progressive city on the European continent at the time. It already had a sewage system and street lighting. The city's population, around half a million people, prayed in 3,000 mosques and purified themselves in 300 steam baths, the hammocks. Cordoba, Seville, and Granada were famous for their universities, where philosophy, law, literature, mathematics, medicine, astronomy, history, and geography were taught. The power and prosperity of Islamic Spain reached its peak in the 10th century. The central state then fell apart as a result of internal disputes. In 1085, the Christian Reconquista achieved its first major victory with the fall of Toledo. At the end of 1491, the last Muslim ruler in all Andalus, capitulated to the armies of the Castilian monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella, and surrendered the city without fighting, in January 1492. This put an end to Islamic supremacy in Spain. Thereafter, a struggle against Islamic culture began, which reached a tragic peak in 1499, when Cardinal Francisco Jimenez de Cisneros had 80,000 Arabic books burned in Granada. Another catastrophic event took place already more than 200 years earlier, in 1258, when Baghdad, the most important cultural center of Islam, was destroyed by the Mongols. The House of Wisdom, which contained countless valuable historical documents on subjects ranging from medicine to astronomy, was destroyed. Survivors reported that the water of the Tigris was black from the ink. All other libraries in the city were also burned, as were mosques, palaces, and hospitals. 
scholars, scientists, and philosophers were not spared. Citizens who tried to flee were intercepted and killed by the Mongol invaders. The number of victims is estimated at almost 90,000. The caliph was captured and had to watch as his citizens were killed and his treasures plundered before he too was massacred. The Muslims, who had constantly expanded their territory, suddenly felt helpless due to the superiority of the Mongols. This feeling of powerlessness contradicted the Quran statement in Surah 3, Ayah 110, where it says, You are the best community brought forth for the good of mankind. Many of the Muslim scholars saw the political changes as a punishment from Allah for having strayed too far from the spirit of Islam. They believed that salvation could only come through a return to the genuine and true Islam. To do this, Muslims would only have to follow the traditional values and the way of life of previous generations, as they already possessed all the knowledge, since they were much closer to the time of the Prophet. Thus, the scholars oriented themselves more and more towards the past. Over a century earlier, an important theologian of Islam, al Ghazali, already discredited the study of philosophy and science because it led away from the true faith. He attempted to prove through epistemological arguments that philosophy alone could not comprehend God. This mindset was not a purely Islamic characteristic either. There have always been similar tendencies in the Christian West, for example following the statements of St. Augustine, who said that faith precedes knowledge. The supposedly dark Christian Middle Ages are also due to the fact that the Church long dismissed many scientific findings as heresy. But now, after the traumatic sack of Baghdad and the fall of the Caliphate at the hands of the Mongols, which marked the end of the Abbasid era, many Muslims believe in divine punishment. This way of thinking led to intellectual stagnation and decline. The spirit of research and curiosity was abandoned, and memorizing the Quran soon became the imperative of the day. Until today, Muslims pride themselves on having memorized and being able to recite the Quran or individual passages from it. In the conservative strains of Islam, it is still the case today that anything that cannot be traced back directly to the Quran is to be rejected. Gradually, Islam became more and more backward-looking, and Islamic societies based on Islamic law, the Sharia, became increasingly unfree. This is not the intellectual climate in which science thrives. In today's Islam, science is merely a means to an end in matters of faith. Conservative Muslims are convinced that all knowledge is already included in the Quran and that science must be brought into harmony with it. Therefore, if the Quran cannot be reconciled with science, this logically means that science is wrong. According to this view, science should ultimately confirm the Quran. There is no separation of science and faith, just as it does not exist in the vast majority of Islamic societies, where is no separation of state and religion. That is why more and more Islamic countries are governed on the basis of Sharia, the religious law of Islam. Another event that contributed to the decline of Islamic progress was the result of a fateful decision made in 1485. In that year, merchants in Constantinople, today Istanbul, which had only been conquered 32 years earlier by the Ottomans, approached the Sultan Bayezid II. He was known for his piety, and therefore he listened attentively to the objections of the scribes and legal scholars, the ulama, to the merchant's request to set up and operate the first printing press from Europe. Alongside the Renaissance, the Reformation and the discovery of America, the invention of letterpress printing by Johannes Gutenberg can be considered as a turning point in history and the beginning of a new era. This technological revolution gave more and more people access to knowledge. Until the 15th century, the making of books had been very time-consuming and expensive. 
This meant that only a few could afford books, and therefore education. Gutenberg's new printing technology therefore revolutionized people's intellectual, religious, and political lives. But the ulama scholars at the court of Sultan Bayezid II had some good arguments against the printing press. It was their privilege, acquired through many years of hard work, to be the only ones allowed to responsibly put the sacred Arabic characters on paper. Their pious and highly regarded craft would be devalued by this Christian machine. And what's more, they were afraid that the introduction of the printing press would open the door to all kinds of trash and seditious texts. Therefore, the Sultan should not undermine the foundations of his empire, which was clearly gaining ground against the less knowledgeable and more contentious Christians. Finally, Sultan Bayezid II, agreed with the ulama and banned the printing of Arabic characters throughout the Ottoman Empire. Bayezid was later overthrown by his son Salim, who was the first Ottoman Sultan to take on the title of Caliph. Nonetheless, Sultan Salim I also renewed the ban on printing, even on penalty of death. To be fair, it should be recognized that the advice of the ulama scholars initially seemed to prove correct. In Europe, by no means only noble books were printed, but also numerous texts full of trash, lies and hatred. From 1486, for example, The Hammer of Witches, the Malleus Mulficarum, was published, filled with falsified theological expert opinions on how to identify witches and how to deal with them, including description and instruction in atrocious techniques and methods of interrogation, torture, and execution. This basic work of witch hunting became one of the first bestsellers and long sellers of the printing press. In addition, countless pamphlets denigrating political or religious opponents were also among the most popular printed publications. Nevertheless, it was the Arab and Muslim scholars who laid the foundations for Europe's enlightenment. It is therefore thanks to this scientific heyday of the Islamic world that the science of antiquity was not lost and was further developed in the Middle Ages. Western scholars knew that they owed much of their knowledge to the Muslims. But today, Europeans tend to forget this and sweep it under the rug. To this day, the knowledge of the Greeks, Persians, and Arabs forms the basis of modern science. As a matter of fact, the scientific golden age of Islam was a great gift from the Orient to the Occident. Thank you for watching. I hope you liked and enjoyed the video. Please leave us a comment, a like, and a subscription. Assalamu alaikum to everyone.